Good morning, everyone. I'm an old utility brat since we got a lot of utility people in the room. My dad, who is now deceased, spent 45 years working for the Rural Electric Cooperative. So I know lots of names, probably no names that some of you probably don't even know that are no longer there, that are deceased from various organizations from that standpoint. He also served on the board of uh, directors at Grand River Dam. Governor and I appointed him. He served on GRDA's board for 14 years. So I do know the utility space. That doesn't mean I know it right, but I do know it. So what I want to talk to you guys about today is I'm going to take, you guys got a better mousetrap. You're selling it to the wrong person. Okay? So it's kind of funny. In my class, I talk about what we're after from an entrepreneurial perspective, and you guys are in a growth industry. This thing can go crazy. Align your product with the market fit. So that's what I'm going to preach today. I'm going to preach it. So we're going to find out if I buy anybody in the choir who's going to join me. And I've been preaching this since 1996 when the Edison Electric Institute offered me an opportunity to make a speech in front of every investor-owned utility in Tampa, Florida to talk about converting non-fuel rev fuel revenue to profits. It's published. You can go look it up in Electric Perspective, 1996, okay? So I've been talking about it for 19 years, so that means next year it's going to hit. It takes 20 years in the utility for anything to happen, right? I right, okay. you got one more year, so get on the bandwagon. So 1996, 2016, that's going to be the year it's going to happen. So what I want to do is I'm going to talk about why this is a non-OSU talk. I do know the sector. I am going to be applying the very principles that I talk about in class to this situation. So what I want to do is, if you're going to talk about a market fit, what's the targeted market? Right now you guys are selling to homeowners. You're selling to commercial property owners. You're selling to the end user. Okay, you're selling a capital intensive product to someone that is really concerned about minimizing upfront capital cost. Okay, they've got constrained capital resources. You're selling an expensive product or more expensive than the alternatives that they've got. You guys are swimming upstream. Residential homeowners, oh my gosh, loan to value ratio on your loan. You're pushing up the price. I have to put down more equity. Very short payback. Everything I've seen and researched is, is that owners of a home want less, max, five-year payback. You guys are probably sitting between five and ten years, depending upon the location and the ground's heat sink. they got a high cost of capital. Probably 70% of consumers in the United States have credit card debt. What's the interest rate on credit card debt? Okay, they are capital constrained, yet that's who you're selling to. Commercial property owners, what they care about is the spread between their aggregate tenant rents and their cost. You guys are pushing up. So what you're doing is you're fighting and you're trying to swim upstream. So here's a current, let's look at a current market product fit, okay? They are not technological savvy. Anybody want to argue with that? Try explaining your technology, okay? You have a simple dumbed down video to try to explain it. It's complicated, okay? You can't explain it to them, but they're the customer. If they don't understand it, why are they going to buy it, okay? It's scary. It's not that technically, if for the people in this room it's not scary, it's scary as hell to them. Capital constrained. They got limited capital, yet you're selling a capital product that's expensive. Short payback. Oh, you got a moderate payback. Consumers care about brands. That's why there's advertising. That's why there's marketing campaigns. You guys don't have a brand. You are a fragmented industry of thousands of people. You don't have a brand. They want a brand. Somebody they can trust. Somebody they can blame when it doesn't work. They don't want to blame five different people that put the program together. They want to point out and say, it's your fault. Who is the brand? You guys are made up of cats and dogs and five or six different. You got drillers, you got inside people, you got, okay, you know, get the idea? Does a consumer want that? No. Education. You got to sell the customer, you got to educate them. They got a lot of questions, and you're selling them on something and they're not technologically savvy. Guess what? That is a custom sell. It is an expensive acquisition cost per customer. Selling direct one-on-one -on -one is the most expensive marketing sales channel in the world, and you're doing it. 
Customer acquisition costs are driving you crazy. You're already expensive. You're almost at a push to slightly lower cost. I actually think you're lower than the marginal cost for a utility, not the embedded cost, the marginal cost. But your acquisition costs are driving, just making you more expensive. Customers want a fixed rate. How many of you give customers a fixed rate? You do. That's the first one you hit. Everything I've given you is no, yes, no, yes. That's the first yes, yes. The customer really wants a hedge against inflationary energy fuel prices. You do that. Customers want renewable green. You're giving them a renewable green. Okay. About 80%, 75%, you're missing the mark. You're hitting the mark with 20 to 25%. Okay, so that graph on unit shipment, I would tell you, verifies what I'm saying. You guys have a growth industry, a growth product, and the sales are nosediving. Why? You're selling to the wrong customer is the hypothesis I'm making, and I expect to stir this up. This isn't the same old same. I'm telling you, turn right. So I'm expecting lots of questions, lots of barbs, and I welcome them. I don't mind it at all, because I'm interested in what your all's critique is, because you're in the industry. Black line is gas prices. Gas prices have been going down. Impacts directly the economic value associated with the paybacks, which are too long for the customer anyway. Okay, so let's say we pivot. Okay? We're going to pivot and we're going to flank the competition. Okay? Let's sell and get out of the paradigm box. Let's sell. I mean, if you think about it, what we've been doing is this. You've got your ground source heat pumps. Your industry is selling to a bunch of consumers. What I'm saying is, let's sell to utilities and let the utilities sell to the consumer. And I'm going to show you the difference in how that product market fit flows through that whole sales channel. And I think you're going to see an alignment of interest. Okay, now if you sell to utility, I was at a utility. Gosh, 90, and I was an engineer. 95% of us are engineers at a utility. Don't tell me utilities are not technologically savvy. They are incredibly technological savvy. They understand and they study and they pilot why? Because you've got Monday morning regulator quarterbacks that are going to check everything you do. You're going to aim, study, aim, study, aim, study, and then do it. Okay? You are technologically beyond competent. Been there, done it. Okay? Mix with the product. Now we're not selling to technologically incompetence. We're selling and they match up. Utilities, what you really do, one thing they do, maybe I was because I was treasurer at a utility, you are great stewards of capital. You manage capital. You are capital intensive. It's crazy how capital intensive you are. It's one of your greatest core competencies. You know how to go to the capital markets. You know how to get capital. And guess what? You're selling, if you're a ground source, you're selling a capital intensive product. Why don't you sell to the person that's got the lowest capital cost in America? It's regulated. You're one of the lowest capital costs there is. Align. Match them up. Take advantage. Use each other. Long-term paybacks. Your customer you're selling to wants less than five years. The utility probably averages 25 to 30. You look cheap to a utility, you've got five to ten. Look at the difference. Utilities, another core competency is you know how to procure and you know how to manage vendors. It is a core competency. Utilities are great at it. Our utility procurement people could beat the heck out of any vendor in the world. Okay? They're good. You're good at project management. Why don't we turn that project management loose? And indirectly, you're going to help the ground source. Why? You're going to break the paradigm and you can generate and drive economies of scale so that the vendors that are out there fighting, 
their marginal costs go way down. Help yourself, help your customers, help the vendors. They can give you better pricing on marginal if the volume goes up and you can drive the volume. Why? The utility owns a customer. Or at least you guys are going to say you own the customer. That may be in dispute going forward, but I, when I was at the utility, well, they're a rate payer. We own them. We control them. Okay? We'll see in 20 years. Okay? There's a lot of things going on, but it's this wholesale relationship. But the beauty is, some of your customers may hate you, but they trust you. They really do. <laughs> okay? They know that if they point the finger at them, you are a big entity and you care about taking care of them. Okay? So there is a certain amount of brand preferences, and this applies to IOUs, it applies to co-ops, it applies to municipalities. Okay? You can lower the customer acquisition cost. Why? I, when I was at PSO, we used to be able to run a profile off our database. I could tell you who was using natural gas heat and who had a heat pump based upon the KWH pattern of every commercial customer. And I could profile and stratify that market mix within two minutes. You've got the energy history. Think about your acquisition costs. Compare the acquisition costs to them going out and knocking on the door to a school system and spending six months selling. You can walk out and show, here's your historical, here's what we think it's going to be. you got everything. You don't make 20 trips, you make four. The cost of the customer acquisition is incredibly important in any business. Fuel mix diversification. Thanks to the EPA, most of your utilities are closing your coal plants. Your fuel mix is going the wrong direction, big time. I, as a utility customer, I'm not an employee, but as a utility customer, I don't like it because I know what my fuel adjustment clause is getting ready to do. Don't like it a bit. Okay? No fuel. What a hedge. To you, one of your most things that's going against you. Renewable EPA compliant. No admissions. Green. I took a while ago 75 to 80% that was yes, no. 20%, 25% that was yes, yes, and I turned 100% to yes, yes. I'm waiting for the barbs. It's quiet. I don't know. <laughs> okay, think about it. No one, everyone has just been swimming upstream. Shift and say, can we get the utilities to get us the volume and leverage their brand, leverage their customer, and help the utility help us? It has to be a win-win. Okay, so we said, if all of this looks good for ground source to utilities, we're only halfway home. What's it work for the utility to consumer? Because if this could be great, I said 100%, 20%. If this isn't 100%, it doesn't matter. So let's look at if we took the utility in a wholesale delivery channel to your end customer. Because eventually, the end customer in this whole wholesale sales channel has got to be happy. Okay, we're going to own the ground source loop, and we're going to set up a GO rate tariff. Regulated rate tariff. What do you incremental cost to send out a GO bill on top of your KWH bill? Zero. It's a carriage return on the printer and the ink for a second line. That's expensive, okay? But that's what you're helping. Think about it. Everything we're doing is we're playing at the marginal rates. It's a paradigm shift in the business processes. And as a faculty member, we look for those opportunities. That's what we teach our students. So I'm going to pay a GO tariff. Guess what? I would rather pay, I, you know, I don't know what the percentage is. 40% of Americans lease their car. Think about it. I'm now going to lease them their ground source heat pump. There is a preference, there is a strong, strong orientation that the consumer says, that's what I want, but you won't sell it to them. They're scared to death of inflationary fuel. None. I will proclaim, and we'll talk about it in a minute, if you own the loop, you've got an asset that's appreciating, not depreciating. No fuel, 
you got a 2 to 3% 30-year, 50-year history of inflation in fuel, and you got something that has no fuel, zero, just like this puppy. Only this one doesn't have capacity. This one has capacity, but no fuel. It's wonderful. It's going to help you be competitive in the future because you don't know what kind of new energy sources are coming. And ironically, for the utility, you can help yourself and help the geo vendors by driving economies of scale. It's a win-win. You guys got a wonderful brand. Everyone knows, trust it. There's some love-hate with the consumers. I've been there, okay? But mostly, people respect the energy brand. You can be the remain supplier. You can get compliant. You can use, I heard one of the, you said not everyone can use tax credits. I know the co-ops may be challenged to use the tax credits, but I guarantee you the IOUs can use the tax credits. 100%. Here's the one paradigm shift, and I don't think it's that big, and this is what I argued back in 1996. And the reason it never went is my VP of marketing had an annual bonus that was tied to KWH unit sales, not revenues. <laughs> okay? So there's your paradigm shift. Realign your performance metrics and this thing will work. The customer, they don't ask a customer how many KWH they bought. I dare you. Other than maybe some big commercials, they don't know. Ask them where at their thermostat and they can tell you or ask how big their bill is and they can tell you. They're buying comfort, okay? There's no difference. You can convert the energy transfer in this closed loop system. You can measure the temperature gradient on the fluid and you can bill it as BTUs. Call it a geo KWH. You can convert and bill anything just like you do their normal bill. All right, so what I've hopefully I've showed you is we've said We've got something that's broken. Check, check. Looks pretty good. Okay, looks pretty good if everybody can make money. All I've been talking about is subjective qualitative factors. And it's ultimately going to come down to the almighty buck. So we're going to get to the almighty buck. What I'm saying, and I think I can show you, is I think that there's a very good opportunity, not everyone, not every customer, but the preponderance, and over the next five years, as you start replacing plants and your embedded costs are replaced with marginal costs, the price shock is going to be pretty significant, at least in Oklahoma. Okay? Because I know where most of you are in your capacities. So kind of know what's going on with regards to that. What you can do, and at least for the IOUs in the room, you've got shareholders. I used to report to the CFO. Earnings per share. You've got to drive that number. Right now, you drive that number with economic development and growth that comes in. What I'm saying is you can get a 20 to 30% growth organically with your existing customers by stop paying the fuel company and build a customer the same amount where it's 100% earnings, rate-based earnings. I'm going to show you in just a second, but that's the paradigm. It's kind of like, you know, if I can do good tax management and I pay the IRS less, doesn't hurt the consumer, doesn't hurt the company. Nobody wants to pay the IRS. Why do you want to pay the natural gas or the coal company or the company that's delivering fuel? You're not making any money on it. And you're spending tons of your resources and time managing something that is of no shareholder value. None. Why don't you convert managing something that is of shareholder value? and your customers want. You repeat a little bit, diversified fuel mix. Oh man, if I was a marketing person, I would be going crazy right now. You can do fixed rate contracts. You can do green premium pricing. You can uh, target your federal mandates for customers. I can go crazy. I think I can make a half a dozen marketing programs around this concept. I want something to sell. What I'm saying, this gives you something to package, program, design, go sell. And the consumer wants it. Okay, the almighty buck arrives. Okay, I'm going to do a primer on a rate case. And I managed a rate case. So I was the executive in charge, which means I was the youngest person there, so that when I messed up, they were going to fire me. 
Okay, that's exactly what it amounts to. I figured it out about six months after they gave me the job. Okay, he's expendable. Give it to, give it to, he'll eat anything. Give it to him. Okay, weighted average cost of capital. Very simple. And I warn you, I made 47 and 53, so it'd be 10%. I want the math to work. I know I got a lot of very technically savvy people in the room, but I wanted the math to be simple. I'm trying to sell you a concept or for you to rip me apart on a concept, I'm not showing you the exact program, even though I've done it for Georgia Power and a couple of other people, okay? I'm just wanting to be at the 40,000 flyover. So we got a 10% weighted average cost of capital, okay? We gotta have a revenue requirement to recover our capital cost. So the utility is going to own, not the system in the building, just the loop. Okay, you're going to own the loop. So let's say that that 450,000, 10%, so 45,000 bucks. You're going to rate base that and you're going to have depreciation over 45 years. You can make it more, make it less. I spill it the difference between 40 and 50 numbers I've been thrown out. I saw even a 100 year number up here today. So 45 years. So you're going to get 55,000. That's what you got to get to recover the Asset, remember your good starts of capital. So you got to get a return on that asset to the debt holders, the mortgage holders on the debt, the equity holders in the company, and you got to get the principal back. Okay, so what's it look like from the consumer? Okay, this is based, and I gross these up, the actual building I've got that I've been studying is 860 kWh, and it's spread out. I didn't want to use 860, so I just proportionally scattered. So this is based upon a studied actual building, but I have disguised it and made all the numbers round in order to convey a meaning. Million kilowatt hours, 12 cents, include energy, fuel, your peak demand, everything. Okay? Here in Oklahoma, that's probably high. But again, I'm making the numbers multiply out. You can change it. So 120,000 bucks. So the customer that's out there in a large commercial building is paying the utility 120,000 bucks. With a geo, and the numbers we've been looking at is 30% to 70%. I just took 50. Again, round numbers. I want to make sure that everything works mathematically easy. So I can now say I'm going to sell or save 500,000 KWs. What was the revenue requirement? Previous page, 55,000. So if I'm going to sell 500,000, 11 cents. Well, I got a cheat sheet and I know the customer is going to be better off already. The customer, 500,000 of, quote, electric kilowatt hours, 500,000 of geo kilowatt hours. They say 5,000 bucks. Not a big number, but 5%. Now what's interesting, that's against your embedded 20 year old cost, not your marginal cost, your embedded cost. This program is competitive with you today, not 10 years from now. Today, embedded, trailing cost. And trust me, I know what a pole depreciation is from 1940 class versus a replacement today. It is night and day difference. So I got a program that's competitive. Now, let's play something with a number. Let's say you're a municipality or co op. Change this number because we're not going to do 10%. I'm all debt. I'm borrowing from the federal government, REA. 5%. I got a tax free municipal bond, 5%. I just now j cranked up that number to, t I think it was, let me just see. I'm bad doing math on the fly. 22,500. I just saved the customer 20% on their energy bill with a fixed inflationary hedge with no escalation. Oh, and I didn't even factor in the tax credits that you can get. Oh, I didn't factor in. What if you have transmission or distribution capacity constraints? Decentralized generation, I just freed that up. I didn't factor in that you just bought this capacity back for free. You can sell it again. So I'm not showing you the really good stuff, but I can show you that I can make this work 
was somewhere between a probably a minus 5, minus 10. There are some utilities that have incredibly low rates. It may not work. The bulk of you, it's going to work. Not everyone, so I'm not advertising everyone. Not one shoe fits all, but a lot of it is going to work. And again, I'm not dealing with, when I was at PSF, we used to have a marginal rate that the fuel cost on the marginal rate was 70% because I wanted to compete with the gas company. So think about, this is just average. What you've got to look at, you all are putting in time and use meters. What is your fuel conversion to profitable income at the marginal kilowatt hour? It'll get better, I promise. Huge difference. Okay? Because I'm only using 40% fuel, and I know some of you's got 50 or 60% fuel at some marginal block rates, depending upon your designs. Okay, so the customer, we can play with it, but we can probably get the customer anywhere from a minus 5 to probably 15, 20% savings. Significant. Oh, by the way, if you want to pay them 100 bucks per KW demand reduction, you can give them another 20,000 bucks if you want to pay them, and you'll have probably a 24 to 36 month payback on that DSM capacity buyback. Really effective. So if you need to incent from a marketing perspective the customer more, like I said, I, I cut this down to the simple, simple, simple stuff. You can start, I, mean, I know how you design rates, you can get really sophisticated in where you want to go with this. Okay, so we can make it work for the customer. If it doesn't work for the customer, we're dead. Okay, now does it work for the utility? We're working backwards. On the qualitative, I had to work top down through the whole supply chain. Now on the economics, I got to start with the customer and work all the way back up. So I've proven it'll work for the consumer in most cases. So will it work for the utility? Well, you were selling a million kilowatt hours at 12 cents and I assumed 4 cents of fuel. So you're making 80,000 bucks. Now that's got a cost of service component in it, it's got depreciation, I'm not even going to get into the, nit <laughs> the nitty details, just keep it at a gross profit. So that's my gross profit contribution. I do the geo, 500,000 at 12, 60, 500,000 at 11, 55, that reconciles to the previous slide, the customer was getting savings on 115, your fuel cost drops to 20. You've made 15,000 bucks for your company. 10% increase in earnings. No change in customer. No economic development. No incentives to move anybody in your service territory. You've driven from your existing customer. And who loses? Somebody's got to lose. Who loses is the gas company or the coal company. And the fuel company. It's not a zero-sum game. Somebody's, somebody's going to get bored. I mean, it's going to happen. But you're changing fuel to profitability, and you can accelerate the growth of your earnings while delivering savings on energy to your customer. Kind of interesting, isn't it? All right, so what we're doing is we're trying to look at a program that we can enable the utility to get into this chain so that we can go from here to here and take advantage of all the qualitative subjective advantages that every party I think is going to be at least 90% if not 100% aligned with favorable economics for the entire chain and what we're able to do is we're basically shifting fuel revenue Back when I was there, I think we had about $900 million in revenue, and I think our fuel bill was almost like $550. That's a lot of value. That's like saying your company's really only doing $450 in revenue. It's a pass-through. Okay? So we're going to play that game. The other game we're playing is we're going to have a long-life asset. On this asset, what's interesting is when you go out and you educate that customer and you've got to talk to them and convince them, what happens if the conductivity of the ground is off? Who takes it? The customer. What happens if there's a problem? Who takes it? The customer. What I'm saying is let's change the risk prodigm to acceptance from the marketing. What do utilities also do? They manage statistical programs. 
You charge the same tariff rate to a consumer, and some of them are at the end of a 10-mile line out in the country, and some of them are in the city with 20 customers per mile. You charge the same rate per customer. What you're doing is statistically diversifying the performance of the asset. You take the risk away and you manage that risk against your capital deployment because you, if you drill and own the loop, you're statistically reducing the risk so that you, instead of cutting every one of these pre-studies by the fine line, put a margin of error. Some will be better, some will be worse. The whole point is if you can put in 3,000 of those ground source loops, on average, I bet you the statistic, you're going to be really, really close to what you need. Okay, I made a little more on one and a little less. Well, that's true of every customer you've got. There's no difference. Green, fixed, LED. Man, this is, go talk to your communications PR department. See what they think. We haven't even talked about them. Your PR department's going to be all over this. Uh, I don't know how some of these federal buildings that have got these 30 mandates over the next... Without geothermal, I don't know how they're going to do it unless somebody invents some widget that I can now put that in there and generate electricity and have no idea. It's one of the few things from a base load that is going to enable. I would be stripping my customer database with federal commercial accounts and that I teach stratification of customer class. It'd be the first customers I'd be calling on. They got lots of cash. They're typically technically savvy. It's a customer class if you sell one federal building. It's easy to sell all 50, 60, 100 that you've got. Again, lower your acquisition cost per customer that helps in the vendors, that helps you, that helps the consumer. It helps with everything with economies of scale. Uh, you're going to diversify your generation mix. If you're going to do it, you've got to go do it. You can't do one or two. I mean, go do 5,000, 10,000. Peak capacity, we talked about that. The program, and you can sit down and I would challenge you, you can throw me up against the wall, but I think I can take your embedded rate and with most customers, not all, I can be competitive. Pretty close. So that's kind of where I want to leave you. What I'm saying is they came in and the question was, I was challenged. Everyone in this room would say, amen, first cost barrier is our biggest problem. Okay? I can't change the technology. What I can change is the market. So what I'm telling you or what I'm up here preaching about is shift the market. Shift a paradigm and become a utility with decentralized asset deployment that's incredibly cost advantage that ticks off every consumer qualitative subjective box in the book. So anyway, at least I think I got you thinking because it's been real quiet up here. So I, I'm willing to bring on questions, but I hope I push, and I, I've been pushing this off and on for over, almost 20 years now. And I think it's about to happen. I really do. I'm seeing some co-ops put in you, you, rates. Here's the difference. I, and I sent another, uh, another executive shared something with me, and I think it's right on. A lot of utilities are trying to do this by providing substances to loans so the consumer owns it. Does that diversify the consumer's risk? No. Does it diversify the education of the consumer? No. Okay? Guess what? Good luck repossessing a ground source heat pump loop. <laughs> but if you set it up as a tariff, they don't pay. What do you do? Turn the meter off. They're going to pay. They will. Okay? Oh, you're saying no. They'll pay eventually. No, no this commission does not allow you separates the two because we've been down this road. Okay, well I'm really interested in those comments. So I'd love, let's, but that's where I'm going with it is I think from a tariff standpoint it makes it easier. You don't have to be subject or subject your consumer to all the bank rules. You give them a loan, you're subject to all the banking regs. That's a nightmare. You think you guys got a nightmare? I've been around banks, they got it worse than utilities as far as regulation. They really do, okay? Try reading the Consumer Lending Act. Okay? If it's a tariff, it's different. So anyway, that's kind of where I'm leaving it. I'll shut up. Questions? I like, I like where you're talking legend rate. And from what I'm seeing in your program, you wouldn't even have to change your rate. You wouldn't have to drop it to pay to show for the consumption. That is very interesting. 
depending upon your rate, it could actually be lower than your existing energy rate. And, that, and that's what I'm saying. As far as it being transparent, you don't really have to be transparent. You can leave it at the same rate and the utility can reap the benefits. Yeah, you, you can blend it in. I mean, that's why you got these adding time use of meters and everything else. I'm just saying advocate and pull in another meter reading. It's easy. And the capacity constraints is very interesting angle to resell that capacity, recapture the capacity in constrained areas. You can do it because my cost of this or your cost at ground source is pretty close to your embedded cost. Not for all you till a couple of you are really blessed, but you're getting ready to hit a hockey stick on that cost. It's coming real quick. <laughs> I can see it coming. What I'm seeing in our areas is a lot of the drillers, or not drillers, but the installers are actually absorbing the tax credits and the rebates offered in their construction costs and their, and their yeah. estimate uh, to the consumer. One of, one of the other interesting twists here, uh, just to point out on the economics that's really interesting, um, it's right... Here, this is 55000 That's your cost of capital at day one deployment of the asset. What happens in year five? You've depreciated five years, so if you go in for another rate case, it's going to go down. What's interesting to show you how well this is, I've actually thought about it. I'll go out and raise money from a pension fund that's got a 30-year investment life. You know what the amortization of this is at a 10% note? And a pension fund would kill for that annuity, a life insurance that's selling annuities. 10%, that drops to 45600 bucks. Add that to your $5,000 savings, and all I did is switch away from the utility to pension fund. Somebody's going to fund it. The key is, I agree, you got a better mousetrap. I, man, I've drank the Kool-Aid. It's a great mousetrap. Problem? You're selling to the wrong person that really didn't care. And I'm throwing water on you up here, sorry. You got to find somebody with volumes. Yeah, and a gas utility. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have any gas utility people in the room. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> the gas utility guys have, and gals have nothing to compete with you for electric sales in the summer. This does. But, but there's some gas utilities looking at doing it. Maybe. They got pipe users. They don't even know how to run pipe. So it can work for the it can work for the electric utility. That's what I grew up in. So that's kind of where I was taking it, converting fuel. So what do you do? Get an access easement? You know, I don't know. And, and here's the good news. You know, you guys are smarter than me. I just wanted to shake up the box at 40000 Now you just drill down to 20000 and you guys are more competent than I am. So I'm not going to preach on that. My guess is if you could put the loop in the utility easement, you could actually then be able to collateralize it, securitize it as an asset, which would make your CFO really happy with regards to being able to do mortgage bonds, which keep your cost of capital down. So I think there's some angles, and I don't know on the square footage if it'll all fit in the easement, but my initial reaction is you just put it in the utility easement, get an assignment, and you can collateralize it and secure it for mortgage bond purposes. So, 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 so,
You do it all the time with stranded assets right now. It's a statistical base. Utilities are really great at managing statistics. That's why you can diversify risk that these individual consumers can't, that you're trying to educate them on and you're swimming upstream and trying to convince them that you're right and they're wrong. Utilities can just take all that risk, take it off the table, put it in a portfolio because you own enough customers. What's really cool about this, and I've talked to a few building owners, let's say I've got a building owner in suburban, well, in Edmond. And for some reason, they get overextended, not enough tenants, the building goes into bankruptcy. Okay, who is going to take the hit? Probably the equity holder or the mortgage bond holder that funded the building. So whoever comes in and buys the building says, I'm going to right size this building so it's going to be profitable and they're going to auction it off or bid it or it's going to sell at an equilibrium a break even. You sit there for six months, you don't sell anything, you don't have to deduct yours. They come back on, throw the switch, start building them. You, your asset will not get hit with a devaluation of the building it's a little higher risk if you get into a rural stranded home that maybe not turn as much. But municipalities, larger cities, commercial buildings, no problem. They will eventually, after foreclosure, they're going to be right sized so that it makes sense for the new owner. And guess what? They're going to turn you on. Bang. So you just factor it into the cost of service and the numbers are good enough that you can fudge that in is just part of your cost of service from a statistical perspective. Yes, sir. How do you incentivize, make an incentive for builders to spend the extra uh, cost of a geothermal system versus a conventional system? Who's you that? They don't. You own it. They don't pay. They don't pay for the loot. Utility owns it. Yeah. My, okay. Here's mine, and I'm working through. So that's a good question. You guys are catching up with me real quick. I've been running real fast little, to get in front of everybody. Here's what you do: is you're going to pay them 50 bucks or 100 bucks per KW demand reduction for DSM. You can rate base the DSM program through the commission. You pay. You you're going to pay for the homeowner that when they buy the home, the DSM will go over to them and it'll give them less than a 12 month payback on the premium between an HVA system and the ground source inside the house. How does the builder get that? Builder doesn't. We make him agnostic. He doesn't care. We wash him out. So we pass it directly to the homeowner that's paying a little bit more. So when they go to close, they get the DSM rebate that comes in for the KW reduction. And it gives them a great payback. It may even be a negative payback. It may be more. I actually think it's more. You can actually lower your KW from like 175 or 200 to KW, lower it down to 50, and I still think you're going to break even. And the homeowner, so the home builder is totally zeroed out. No impact. None. Can the municipalities get into that act? I'm sorry? Can the municipalities get into the act? I think the municipals can, absolutely. Yeah. I really do. Code issues. Could they bring in code issues that may... Oh, I think the coal company and the gas comp natural gas companies are not going to love you. You're not making any money on them. Or they're going to do this. Or they're going to do this. So, it's interesting things are coming. I think, I think, like I said, I started talking about this 20 years ago. Times are about to change, I think. I really do. I'm seeing too many things. I haven't studied the Caddo. I'm seeing some things. You were talking about the 7,000 homes down in Texas. I mean, man, you want to really put on 15, 16 cents for some of the big high expensive utilities, and this puppy really hums. Yes, sir. A few comments about Caddo. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they're, being, uh, they're receiving some incentive from uh, G&T, Western Farmers. Western Farmers. But, I mean, Caddo decided not to add any tariff at the consumer level because they felt that the demand benefits they were receiving benefited their whole rate base. Mm -hmm. So they're basically saying, when I spread this all out, it's benefiting even the people that didn't buy it. No, I, 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 I agree. I'm just, but the difference is that with an IOU, there's a third party in the deal called a shareholder. And I think Kaibichi does have some small monthly tariff. Cato just said, you know, we don't think it's even worth messing with. Yeah, yeah, and right. and farmers looking to own the loop. So, well, what? Cato does own the loop. Right? And the people that are on this program, they own the loop. And I will say, just from the standpoint of the builder, they came up. 
we now have some of the largest track builders in Oklahoma that are now doing geothermal that never would never until would. that happened. Hey, I, I really believe that we've aligned, I mean, utilities are great capital managers. They manage capital, low cost. They are great project managers. They are great procurement managers. I mean, everything that fits really fits. You can diversify a portfolio and you take all this, the negatives from the individual consumer and you take them away. And they have a space customer as a class. Yeah. Now again, that's easy for me to talk. I'm not going to be the one to have to implement it. So. <laughs> <laughs> this will, of course, save from having to build additional power plants. Hopefully, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Majorly. I mean, I've talked to some few. You get in certain areas back east. I'm telling you, forget power plants. We're talking transmission. Not in my backyard is incredibly killing people in certain areas. Not so much in Oklahoma, but you get out and it can be huge. And this, the real value, I think, for some of them is on certain feeders of transmission grids or even distributions. In Brooklyn, the Queens was paying 5000 They came to have a full reduction. Dang. Dang. But it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, there, there are three classes of customer, three classes of utilities that would be looking at this. One is, of course, the IOUs. And I, that's more my perspective, though I do appreciate the co-ops. And then the co-ops would be your second. The third would be the municipalities. Uh -huh. yeah. And in a municipality, they're so revenue uh, struck from taking all of the revenue that comes in in their electric service to provide all the other infrastructure. I agree. Reducing that tends to be something that they say, oh, wait a minute, I can't do whoa, that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No. You're increasing. Oh, okay. Let me finish my so they're going to look at the concept of if I put this in, or if, it, if we do this, I've got to add this tariff back in. Mm -hmm. So if I put in some type of a rate tariff based on something, mm -hmm. uh, then there's two issues that we have. Number one, I don't have people to install this type of equipment or this stuff or to, or to quote, maintain it. That's always their, their catchphrase. I don't have anybody that's expertise mm -hmm. in this area. And number two, uh, how do I adjust my rates to compensate for this? So what type of rate would you look at or how would you adjust the rate for a municipality? For a municipality, I think it's wonderful. For a municipality, what I showed is that I could lower the rate from 12 cents to 11 and I increase the cash flow to the municipality and the customer actually saves 5%. It doesn't have to be earnings, it could be cash flow. So I've increased the cash flow. And I will tell you, the other thing, utilities really do well, and sorry, utilities are going more and more and more and more that way. You outsource everything. I mean, I'm joking. 50 years from now, utility is going to consist of two employees. No, come on. There's going to be two. I joke. I've been in a utility, and I'm going to call it straight. I mean, so you, you talk about outsourcing. You've got this whole ground source population out there. Okay. Outs outsource it. I mean, I'm serious. You're not the experts. Outsource it to the experts. And what you're doing is if you'll drive the volume, you're going to get better and better pricing. And he, and he still makes money. And he, and he can pass it on because now we're, we're leveraging the operating scales and we're pricing at marginal rates versus an embedded fixed cost. Because those providers are predominantly fixed cost providers with their rigs for drilling and all the other stuff. And so if you can raise their volume so that their capacity goes from probably 30 or 40 percent today because they're out drilling water wells, if you can raise their capacity up to 70 or 80, I guarantee you the cost of the boreholes are going to go way down. And you're helping yourself and you're helping your customer. It's a win-win-win. And you're creating jobs. And you're creating jobs in your service territory. You're not shipping the money to Wyoming. I mean, but it works for a municipality. You will increase the amount of discretionary cash flow generated in a municipal owned utility. You're going to lower your fuel bill to whoever your provider is that you're buying purchase power from. I, I, I have a comment on that. Municipalities are run by city councils mm -hmm. or uh, the appropriate uh, utility agency, whatever it's called. Those change pretty frequently frequently. New people come on board, old people leave. So anybody involved in trying to promote a program like this 
is going to have to continually resell and re-educate apart from the education process up front. Yeah, but I would rather have the education process on the politicians or the community leaders, and I would argue that that's a core competency for utilities. I mean, I really believe that's one of your core comp. I mean, I know, man, we could lobby at the commission. Anyway, I'm not saying it's a panacea. I'm probably trying to overemphasize. So, you know, back up to reality maybe, but I'm really wanting to drive you to the edge to make a point, to make you think, and I would welcome over the next month, two months, poignant questions, emails, etc., because... I've been barking this fuel conversion to, to, to cash flow or profits, and it works, okay? I hate paying the taxes to the IRS. When I was at the utility, I hated paying the fuel bill, okay? So anyway, that's what I'm pushing. I think it works, and I'm interested, and I think you can help out the ground source industry tremendously because if you guys jump in this, you're big, you bring the brand, you bring the credibility, you bring the customer, and you can leverage it and you'll drive their prices down even though they may still make more money. You're going to drive their prices down and even make it look better. And it works now. Okay, thanks everybody.